is a Rails user by day and an arch aficionado slash Vim enthusiast by evening. You may have heard of him from his internet moniker, Typecraft. Yeah? He actually has a really cool name, Chris Power, which is kind of insulting that he'd even need an internet moniker. It's like, that's a pretty, pretty sweet name. Uh, but he, his uh, tutorials on Vim and Arch were so good that even DHH used it and then released a whole bunch of really cool stuff. So please welcome to our stage, and he's going to tell us about Rails and Go and a little bit of nerd magic. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Everyone's favorite part of a conference talk is when the speaker messes with their computer really quick, so just don't mind me. Oh, I know. Okay. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then we're going to do that. Never mind. <laughs> All right, so I'm actually just going to look at that monitor, and we're going to do this live because, you know, whatever, it's fun. Okay, so we are going to talk about something that's, you know, a personal pet project of mine that I just had fun working on, and I just wanted to share it because I think it's a really interesting project, and I had a lot of fun doing it. Oh, wait, the screen's not changed. I see it on that monitor. Hey, there we go. Thank you. We're doing it. I call this uh, Vim as a service, and it sounds a little bit weird, but you'll know what I mean when I get into it. Okay, so first of all, you might be wondering, who am I? Thanks for that lovely introduction, by the way. Maybe you're not thinking that anymore, but I am Chris, and on the internet, I go by Typecraft. And I make YouTube videos. It's just something that I do. And I love making videos. It's, it's, it's really fun, but I want to do something more. I want to build something that I have fun building, but that also is fun for people to use. I want to build something for other people. And so this is the story of how I built what I'm calling Vim Challenges. I lovingly refer to as the dojo. <laughs> but it's fun because it's an online Vim editing experience in the browser, and we're, we're going to talk about it. Now, it didn't end up here on my first try. This took a couple of iterations. But well, you might be asking yourself, why? Why Vim in the browser? Well, I mean, honestly, it just, it, to me, it's just a fun project. I thought it was a cool thing to do. I thought I could help people uh, learn Vim. Everyone gets the same Vim instance. There's no like configuration weirdness. And uh, there's, you know, even if you're using Windows or you don't understand WSL, you can just hop into this web browser and use Vim. And I thought it was a good idea. Now, my first few iterations weren't great ideas. They are actually really bad. Let me explain. Now, the first idea I had, and actually this is something I was thinking of initially. This is like the very first thing I wanted to do with this. I thought it would be a lot easier than it turned out being was basically just recreating Vim in a text field, right? It sounds cool because you can control the text field, you can control how it looks, and it could lead to a really great experience for people who want to use Vim and learn it. And also, <laughs> you can just build things, so why not? So, it could look cool, as I said. Do I have my mouse here? Yes. And I actually got to a fairly decent working version. It looks something like this. And you can see, I like walking over here. I'm just going to run real quick. You can see how this would be cool. You can actually control how Vim looks, so you can make it look really interesting. And if you type, like, going into insert mode, you know, it's actually an insert mode. You hit escape, it goes back to normal mode. And you can imagine, I was envisioning maybe, oh, to teach uh, registers, we can show, like, a list of registers below. And, like, it could be a really interesting idea. But in theory, it was good. In practice, it was terrible. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to recreate Vim in JavaScript, but I just, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest it. So then I had another idea. I knew that there are online code editing platforms and, and editors and lightweight ones. And one that I found that was really excellent was Ace. 
Ace, if you haven't heard of it, is a fantastic editor in JavaScript. You can just plop it on a page somewhere, and it looks something like this. And Ace is actually really interesting because it actually has Vim key bindings, and a surprising amount of Vim functionality is actually in Ace. So if I could do the S command, the S command actually works. Uh, I think it's Vim commands. And you can actually substitute with confirmation. So it'll ask you, yes, and then substitute that command. So I thought that was really interesting. Like Ace actually implements a lot of functionality. But I felt like something was missing. It's not, it's not actually Vim. And although I know a lot about Vim, I don't know everything. So it's possible that there are some things that some users might want to do in Vim or learn or something, and maybe Ace just doesn't quite support it. It is fantastic, though, but it's, it's not guaranteed. So I got to thinking. I had this wild idea. What if I take the browser, a modern one like this, <laughs> And then what if I take a real, actual, running Vim instance on the server somewhere, and I put it in the browser? Surely this has never been done before, right? This is a groundbreaking idea. Oh, wait. Well, it's already been done. But here's the thing. Xterm is a fantastic tool for this exact idea. You can use Xterm to actually spin up a uh, kind of terminal in the browser, and it has some really fantastic things. It's super easy to set up. It just takes, you know, you got to download, you get it from the CDN, like you would normally import things in like just a, a basic web page, and then you just create a container. Container, I said that word. You create a container, and then that's it. And if you, in uh, you know, JavaScript, you just instantiate a new instance of the terminal class, and then you have a terminal. And it actually works. And then you just uh, have a couple of hooks for listening for input, and then uh, writing it back out to the terminal when a user actually types something in. And so you put it all together, it's pretty straightforward, and it's pretty simple. This is a very simple implementation. This is like an actual running, like, sort of pseudo terminal in the browser. But I use Rails. I don't want to use just a basic HTML page. So I'm going to go with Stimulus. And then Stimulus also makes it easy. You create a new Stimulus controller. And using that data uh, attribute, you can tell what controller you want your page to connect to through Stimulus. It's just it's pretty simple JavaScript stuff. That's funny. I always have to refresh this slide. I don't know why, but I just do. <laughs> But the stimulus stuff, see, that's the thing. It only takes care of the, of the beginning, right? It's only the front end. And as you can see in this super scientific uh, thing that's actually not rendering very well, we have the browser, and then we have, I can't even read that, and then a pseudo-terminal instance. And then you have to connect them together through a back end. I remember now what that middle one was. It's called the back end. So the idea is we are going to create a pseudo-terminal instance somewhere channel it through a backend, API, Ruby on Rails, whatever it may be, and then talk to the front end and stream that data back to Xterm.js. And what's cool here is you can actually do this in Ruby. Ruby has a built-in pseudo-terminal library. It's called PTY. And it works pretty well. But there's a problem. You see, Ruby actually isn't built for concurrency, at least not like this. Whenever you instantiate a new Ruby thread, it, it, it creates a whole entire operating system thread, an OS thread, and that takes up like a few megabytes of memory, which is not good if you want a lot of users. And uh, <laughs> I've been getting pretty popular lately, so I think a lot of users are going to use this. So that's not good. Also, it has a global VM lock, meaning when one thread is locked, all of them are locked. And that leads to the problem of our pseudo-terminal locking threads on I.O. Now, what does that mean? I, I came up with a very scientific image that I think explains it really well. Got it? So every time someone types, it's blocking all the threads, and that ain't good. So we need a new approach. Now, here's the thing. I've been a developer for 15 years. I've been a consultant for a long time. I've worked with all kinds of languages, Elixir, Rails. 
Dart and Flutter. Any Flutter people? No? Okay, I didn't think so. Oh, there's two of them. All right, what's up, guys? And so I drew on my mountains of knowledge throughout my career, and I came up with a good solution. <laughs> it turns out Go is fantastic with concurrency and with this exact problem. Go has subroutines. Sorry, sniffles. It only takes up a couple kilobytes of memory. They're really lightweight. So you could run essentially thousands of these things in what it would take a single OS thread in Ruby. Also, it has a built-in scheduler, so it just kind of manages all these processes itself. So it's a great solution. And all it takes is Go Funk. That creates the Go routine, and that's all you need. So if we have Go, and we have our Go Funk, we have Go routines, it's all working, how do we talk to Go? Well, we create WebSockets. It's pretty straightforward. There's, uh, I think it's a Gorilla's the WebSocket library. Pretty straightforward, you can uh, create a WebSocket, you can upgrade a connection to the WebSocket connection, handling uh, a single endpoint. And then in Stimulus, in Railsland, it's also pretty simple. Since it's just JavaScript, we create a new WebSocket, pass in the URL, and then we can talk to our, our Go server through WebSockets. And, those, and then when we receive a message from the WebSocket, this is in Stimulus still, we can parse that message, meaning this is us streaming the data from Go to Rails, we parse that data, and then we call handle message, which essentially does the right thing that we showed earlier in Xterm. And then this looks something like this. And I do not have my notes. So I am doing this live. <laughs> I don't mean to be, I do not mean to be promotional. That's not the point of this talk. But it looks something like this. And if I had my computer set up well, I would show off that, and then I just close my window. Okay, 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 very good. Okay, don't mind me. I did not want to do this, by the way. This is not the point of this talk. <laughs> but, so how this works is that in the network tab, you would see that we actually uh, upgrade to the WebSocket connection. And every time I type, that letter goes to our Go server running a pseudo terminal instance. And at the end of it all, it comes back to Rails. It gets written in X term. And then there you go. You're off to the races. So that's the basic terminal. But I wanted to do something a little bit more. I wanted to actually do challenges for people so we could actually learn something with them. And how do we score it? Well, AI. It's actually a fantastic use case for AI because Vim I see as like that game Othello, right? You can, you can understand it in a day or so, but it takes a lifetime to master. And so who am I to judge how someone did on a Vim challenge. They could have used some kind of exotic command that I didn't know about. And so AI is actually fantastic at scoring stuff with Vim. And I just, I just already said these slides, so I'll just keep going. And Rails actually makes this pretty easy. You see, you can create a service class and a job that we can asynchronously score users' output from Vim and their keystrokes, send that up to AI, to uh, some LLM, give it some parameters, and it comes back with a score. And this is great because it's all synchronous. It's, this is all in the job. In our job, which runs asynchronously, did I say asynchronous, by the way? We, uh, we post to AI, whatever it is, whatever model, and then that's it. You get the response back, you parse it, and with the result, we use HTMX. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is Rails. We use Turbo. Turbo is actually really great. And um, it's, it shares a lot of similarities with HTMX. It's fantastic. It's all about sending uh, HTML over the wire through WebSockets. It's awesome. 
So when we get a score back, we can broadcast the partial section is actually a, a, a small piece of HTML with the score and some feedback. And we broadcast that onto a page where we're actually listening for that broadcast. So let's show it off. Now I'm super nervous because <laughs> this just didn't get set up the way I wanted. But I'll just explain it. So this is an actual Vim instance. I feel like I'm not giving any love to you guys. So let me just run over here real quick. I've been over there a lot of times. I, I haven't hung out with you guys yet. So this is a real Vim instance running on a digital ocean droplet in Go in a subroutine that spun up a new pseudo terminal instance. We're talking to it via WebSockets between stimulus and that WebSocket endpoint that we put in Go with that handler. It upgraded the WebSocket. And then we can actually type around in Vim. I'm going to attempt this really quick. There we go. So this is actually me typing in Vim. So this is Vim. I can't see what I'm typing. I'm sure that's terrible. But that's actual Vim instance. So when someone is done, you can submit this, and then you get a score back. This is going to be zero because I actually didn't do you know, the challenge. I didn't actually uh, do what I was expecting. But what we get back, we, you can see we send the keystrokes, we send the output. If the output matches the expected output, we actually have AI score it. This one didn't get scored because I couldn't see myself typing, but you know, whatever. Live conference talk, what are you gonna do? But that's it. I thought it was a fun project. I wanted to show you guys. Thanks for having me on stage. It's my first conference talk, a little bit nervous, but thanks. Hello, hello. First conference talk and you did it blind? That was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't expecting it. Okay, so um, you've got a full-time job. Yes. You've got a bunch of kids at home. Three. And you decided, let's build, let's build it into the browser. How do you have the time, the energy, the motivation? How, how are we getting all this stuff done? Um, after the kids go to bed. Okay. <laughs> I just hang out and just code for a little while. And uh, on the weekends, I just, when it's a passion project, you find time to get things done. You squeeze it into your day. And if you do just a little bit every single day, at the end of, the, you know, a month or so, you actually have, like, a real project, and it's, it's actually built. And what's, what's, you say, do a little bit every day? What's the trick to uh, finishing a single thing versus doing a little bit and never finishing anything? Yeah. Well, you got you to gotta break it down, right? Like, I didn't have in mind the whole entire concept of scoring a Vim challenge, a Vim challenge in general, anything like that. I just started with the Ruby PTY thing, right? So then you get that running, that's just a little bit, then you feel a little accomplished, and you go, okay, maybe I could do a front end for this. Then you discover Go, it's just little steps at a time, and you just break it down, and then you just you keep that motivation going. Wow, it's very impressive. Yeah. I love that you used Arch, by the way. Y'all <laughs> <laughs> give it up for Chris. Thanks, guys. Good job.